uh, we have with us uh, Nicholas Hoffman. I just tell you a little bit about him. Nicholas is a design resource, a curator. He is also the founder of the Rune Gramophone Society. He is a writer as well, though he tells me that he is a wannabe writer. Not quite there yet. And uh, he also has probably the largest collection of music in the country. And that music includes not just Western classical and Indian classical, but also uh, Indian light classical and even jazz and rock. So if you ever need music of any kind, then this is how you catch. Uh, so Nicholas today will be conducting this our session on some of India's greatest and most colourful musicians of who were alive from 1900 to 1950. And he's also going to play for us some of their most beautiful music. So over to Nicholas. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Very, very kind of you to turn up on this cold winter evening. Uh, there is a little sharing hai aaj. and uh, the sharing is basically the music and the musicians of roughly 1900 to about 1950. Kala is it's that kind of flower. It's the last thing to flower in any civilization and it's the first thing to vanish when a civilization begins to weaken. So music is also like that. India between 1900 and 1950 went through all kinds of flux. So music also, because music and every other art is based on patronage. So different kinds of patronage vanished, different kinds of patronage came up. And musicians like everybody else, tended to find their spaces within this patronage. So, we wanted to just have a look at very briefly Indian history in that context and the kind of music that came out of that kind of history. So, I'm going to do the maximum I can to play you the maximum amount of music that I can because these names are not even played on All India Radio anymore. Okay? So, it will be a good introduction for a lot of us. Uh, I'll, most of you are well educated people, you know your history backwards. So I'll just sort of do an impressionistic two minutes, three minutes on the history and then do as much as I can on the music. Okay, uh, all of you must have seen a movie called The Titanic. Yes? So there's that scene right at the end where the old lady lets go of the diamond and she says, Well, I've told you about Jack. If you remember him, then he lives. And that's the same with these musicians I'm going to share with you. If you remember them, they live. If you don't, they won't. Okay? Okay, about 1900 to 1950. This is a quotation from Charles Dickens. So this is the way it is, uh, the way it was between 1900 to 1950. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. Well, not too different from 2016, actually. Uh, but every place, every space uh, throws up its own opportunities. And it's in the, uh, you know, the, they say the hour uh, of the greatest darkness is the hour just before dawn. So let us hope. Um, let's look at where we were very, very briefly for two, three minutes. Um, the princely states were going and these were where musicians used to find their patronage. So these were going, the Maharajas and the Rajvadas had less and less money to spend on pursuits like these. Uh, the Raj uh, was getting consolidated and India were, as we know it, the India that we were sort of growing up with was just about beginning. So these were the sort of states of constant flux that these musicians had to ply their trade in. Here I found some pictures on the net that I'd like to share with you. We had three Delhi Dabars. Here are some pictures from them. Moving forward, these are all our princely rulers at the Delhi Darbar. Only Sogyara. That's His Royal Highness and Her Royal Highness and this little 
clownish figure you see at the bottom was actually a very, very, very important man. He was Punjab's largest landowner. Uh, I think his name was Major General Hayat Ali Khan. Uh, big man, but you know, that's where we were. Okay, he was the herald of the court. This is the agreement between uh, Edwin Lancia Lachans and Herbert Baker and the then Bharat Sarkar to build the new capital that emerged out of the 1911 Darbar. Uh, that is the original Raizina Hill on which Rashtrapati Bhavan now sits. The history behind this is that um, originally this was one of the recommended sites for the Lal Kila 2. Um, that's early construction north and south blocks. This is the beginning of uh, Parliament House. So many things happened. The, these footsteps in history we all know. Uh, World War I had hit us in the early 20th century. All of us, all our rulers were bending over backwards to send food and ammunition uh, to the trenches. And a lot of us didn't like it. Uh, the way a lot of us don't like standing in line uh, in front of bank queues. Well, a lot of us didn't like sending troops and ammunition to the British war effort back then. Uh, as a lot of people protest today, there was a lot of protest back then. It was met with a lot of administrative backlash. Uh, you had lots of different kinds of voices. Uh, you had the Congress and Gandhi espousing non-violence, civil resistance. You had Muhammad Ali Jinnah espousing the rights of the minorities. You had the Hindustan Socialist uh, uh, Revolutionary Army uh, of Bhagat Singh and company uh, espousing armed uh, revolution. You had literature, poetry and speech being used as tools. Uh, Sarojini Naidu and Begum Rokia, especially in Hyderabad, uh, were doing a lot of work in women's education. Ambedkar was using his forums to talk about the disadvantaged and the Quit India and INA movements were a sort of chhatra chaya above it all. So these are the kind of conditions that we're talking about. All these steps we know about, I won't go into them, but we end up in 1950 with the constitution being signed. So that was India's journey. And if that was India's journey, here are the images that accompany India's journey. And no, these are not people standing in bank queues um, moving forward. Post riot pictures moving forward, Shubham. Keep moving forward, Shubham. Protest movements. Senior citizens are thank you. Moving forward, Shubham. Finally able to encash the check. Going forward. The tragedy of 1947. The midnight hour. Okay, so that was basically India's march. But as we look at the kind of march that these musicians had, um, the downsizing of the princely darbars and salons were really where the action happened. Uh, you had two kinds of singers, those that sort of performed at the darbars and rajbaras, and those that performed for the common man at different levels. Okay? Uh, we politely called them tawayafs, uh, but even there, there was a sort of hierarchy uh, among the Tawaiyafs, uh, depending on what kind of skill set you had, if you could, if you were accomplished in the arts, if you were accomplished at music, you could choose your patronage. Uh, and you went all the way down to the basic nuts and bolts of sex work. So you had people working in this profession at all levels. So you had people who were performers here, and you had people who sort of saw themselves at a more brahminical end of the spectrum at the Rajbadas, okay, the court singers, so to speak. But at the end of the day, uh, you were essentially the record player or the CD player or the radio for your patron who wanted a bit of music back then. 
the Rajwadas went down, the recording industry began to go up, the radio began to go up, music schools began to come up as well. Uh, I'll take you through a little bit or rather as much of it as I can. Here's a warning, I have far more material than can be encompassed in 45 minutes. So the worst picture that I can give you is a snapshot of what we would call Baijis, okay? Uh, women singers who sang in the public domain. And if we have a little time, I can take you through some of the music of the Ustads as well, okay? Snapshots of the music as we saw it. This is a picture from 1901. This is the first recording being made. This is Gohar Jan. okay? Uh, the equipment, do you see that round thing over there at the back? That's a horn. And that's the thing that captured the sound, okay? Gohar Jan used to wear a lot of bangles and uh, when she was actually singing, people would have to hold her hands down because that's what you do when you sing. And that khankhanahat of the churis would also get caught uh, in that thing. 1913, you had Raja Harish Chandra, which was a movie. It was actually with Marathi actors and it had English and Hindi subtitles and it ran in Bombay. And there were so few prints that Next one please uh, Shubha. That you had all kinds of theatre acts which gave you the same story in a theatre format. And these were wildly sold out performances also. So these are advertisements for the theatre performances of Raja Harish Chandra. Okay. And this was largely done by the Parsis of Bombay and the, uh, and the Jewish people of Bombay. Moving forward Shubha. Then you had Alamara in 31 where movies began to talk. Okay, these were a couple of people whom you need to know about. Uh, Pandit Vishnu Digambar Paluskar uh, was the father of Dattatraya Vishnu Paluskar or D.V. Paluskar as you know him. Uh, Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram uh, essentially was composed by this man and sung by his son. Uh, he founded the Gandharva Mahavidyalaya uh, which was the first effort at putting music into a syllabus. Okay, uh, till then it was a paramparic affair passed down from guru to student. So these people essentially took all the cheeses and the tukras from the dharanas and put them down into a syllabus which could be broken down into a year by year by year, eight year program of study and established music schools. The first one was opened in 1905 in Lahore by Vishnu Dagi Digambar Paluskar on Dindayal Upadhyay Marg. There is one, two, but that's much later. This is the second guy, Vishnu Narayan Bhatkhande, who was also known as Chatur Pandit because uh, all his methods of extracting uh, uh, pieces from different uh, Dharanidhar singers weren't always uh, above the board. Uh, so he too uh, sort of went by composing uh, a granth on music and sort of breaking it down to a syllabus. Very important people in the gentrification of Indian classical music. Uh, I would urge all of you to watch a film by Sabha Diman uh, called The Other Song. Uh, it essentially uh, talks about a very small journey by Rasulan Bai, who was one of the earlier Baijis. Uh, when she sang a particular Thumri in the 1920s, she sang it as, you know, you have the bowl, the wording of a song. Uh, she sang it as, Nage Mohe Jopanwa Me Chot. Jobanwa is a very uh, loosely structured word which can mean anything from describing your own womanly biology to describing your womanly self. It's a very nuanced, layered word. And by the time she sang that same song in the 30s, she had self-censored herself out of the word Jobanwa to sing, to singing Lage More Karejwa Me Chot, My Heart Is Hurt far more sanitized, far more acceptable to the middle class, uh, which had become the buyer of 78 RPM records. There was no space for Jobanwa in those uh, kinds of audiences. Anyway, so these two guys sort of played a very sort of shaping kind of role. Uh, the third guy who played a very shaping kind of role was our most honorable uh, B.V. Keskar. He was a very puritanical man, studied at the Sorbonne, studied at Kashi Vidya Peet, a uh, bachelor all his life. I can more or less conjecture that there was a pair of shorts somewhere. Uh, don't know about that, but I can conjecture from this. He was responsible for a lot of, a lot of things. He banned uh, light classical music on All India Radio, banned, uh, banned cricket, cricket commentary, banned the use of the harmonium. 
lots and lots of bands, okay? Uh, very, very puritanical. Uh, but yet, a whole lot of wonderful music came out of all this turmoil that you see. Uh, so let's share some of the music itself, okay? Moving forward, Shubha. Once again, sort of harking back to Sabadivan's film, uh, Rasul and Bhai again, apparently in the 60s or sometime, uh, she was reduced to penury to selling uh, paan uh, at the ghats at Ilabad. And uh, over there, uh, from there she came to All India Radio and she looked around at the foyer and looked at pictures of all the other Bhaijis she had who were her contemporaries. And she said, Are, sab log devi ban gaye. Hum hi Bhaiji rahe rahe hai. So that was a very telling statement. All Bhais sort of gravitated towards respectability. Uh, you look at Bega Mahtar, she married a barrister who imposed her, his own uh, sort of restrictions upon her. You look at Malika Pukraj, uh, you look at Malika Pukraj's earlier recordings, they are full of, uh, you know, it's the voice of seduction. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very fleshy, firm voice. And when you look at her, her performances on PTV or, or, or Radio Pakistan, they're nice. But they're, they're not Malika Pukraj. Uh, you hear Abhi to Main Jawaan Hoon done on 78 RPM pre-partition and you hear it when she's covered her head and singing it very straight jacketedly. It's a very different performance space. Anyway, moving to uh, the music itself. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the music of three people first. One is a woman called Gohar Jan. Uh, who made India's first record. Uh, the second is a lady called Siddheshwari Devi. Uh, the third is a lady called Malika Pukraj. If we have time, I'll take you through somebody else. But somebody needs to tell me when I have 10 minutes to go because I want to leave you with a particular piece. Okay? So, uh, moving forward, let's quickly do a little bit of music by all these people. Okay, basically the first person that you're going to hear is Gohar Jan. Gohar Jan was not actually Indian. Uh, she was uh, of Armenian extraction. Her mother was an Armenian uh, who was married to an Englishman in Calcutta. Then she fell in love with uh, an ice merchant in Mirzapur in East UP. Uh, married him, had three daughters by him, fell out of love with him and went, out, went to Banaras with her three daughters, converted to Islam and entered the singing and dancing profession with her daughters. Okay? She took on the name of Badi Malka Jan and Gohar Jan, her daughter, was one of them. All of you have seen a film called Pakiza, right? Yes. So when uh, the Khala uh, decides to take Pakiza away from, you know, because her father lands up at the Kotha and when she decides to take the daughter, the, the girl away, uh, she's told by another friend of hers saying, Gohar Jan ki kothi bik rahi hai, gulabi mahal, 20,000 rupai mein, usko badi dikkat mein hai. This is the Gohar Jan we're talking about. Okay? Uh, Gohar Jan was a woman who knew 10 languages, who wrote her own sort of book of poetry of some 600 compositions. She put together her mother's book of poetry of another 600, 800 compositions. She established herself finally in Calcutta. Okay, Calcutta was a port city where all the merchants of the world converged. It was the center of British power back then, Madras and Calcutta. So as a result of which this woman could converse with anybody from across the world. She knew 10 languages. Okay, so don't write her off as somebody who was a lightweight. She knew how to converse, she knew how to communicate, she knew what to communicate. Uh, when Gandhiji started his movement, uh, she even said, you know, you're broke, you can't run a movement on no money. So let me organize soirees, I'll charge ticket prices and you take the money. Gandhiji being a bit of a Puritan said, thank you, but no thank you. So she was that kind of woman. So let's hear her very first record that she ever made, the first record that was ever made in India. He had no way of knowing that this was Gohar Jan or Manka Jan or whoever or whoever. So he had the number and he knew that this was Malka Jan or Gohar Jan because of this announcement. 
So for the longest time, till about 1910, 1915, every singer said this, my name is this, ya naam ye hai, and so on and so forth. So uh, this recording sounds like Mickey Mouse singing, but it set the market on fire, all right? Uh, all the music of this time is severely compromised in terms of audio. But whenever I listen to it, you know, it's thrilling because for God's sake, it's 116 years old. It's a living document. So, uh, let's hear a little more of her music. This is a very popular old Khumri called Raske Bhare Tohe Mehna. It's in Raj Bhairavi. I'll play it for you by different singers so that you can see how singing itself sort of changes and how performers project themselves. Because you have to also understand the format also played a huge role in shaping a performance. The 78 RPM record was only 3 minutes long. So you had to distill your whole knowledge of a rag into 3 minutes and project it as such. So that was another kind of performance. When you had slightly longer tape, you could project it differently. When you had long playing record, 30 minutes and above, you could project it very differently. So the singing style and the performance style also changed. Raske Bhare Tore Naina by Sudeshwari Devi. You know, 
we're all Lata Mangeshkar fans up to a point. But here's the thing, you know, uh, the thick, sonorous voices of Siddheshwari Devi. Not every woman sings, you know, at needle point like uh, Lata Mangeshkar. Every woman has a voice of her own. And unfortunately, this uniform needle point of Lata Mangeshkar has got every woman for a very long time trying to sing at this very high pitched tone, you know. Uh, Siddheshwari Devi and people like that would liberate you to sing as you please. Archiving, you know, and 
hopefully we'll leave something like that behind for our kids too in whatever we do. Anyway, uh, Malika Pukhra had sang these beautiful, like when you came to Siddheshwari Devi, you could look forward to this whole Mart Ki Thumri, a lot of bhaag. Uh, when she says, Raske bhare tore nena, she'll give you 20 ways of singing that ras so that you can get a feeling of all the kinds of rest that there can be through a voice. Uh, there's a rendering of an old Tumri called Pali Bhare Hai Jamajam Jamajam. Oh man, you should listen to that. It's not about somebody filling water at a well beyond the point. Uh, that woman really nuances her songs fabulously and you need to listen to it in that frame of adult mind perhaps. Anyway, uh, I'll play you one more song by Malika Pukraj and then I'll switch gears. Okay. Respectability from the bazaars of Ahnoor to being the wife of a Punjab government bureaucrat, owning a movie studio and uh, you know being a very very respectable woman but you know I love this sassy picture of hers with her dark glasses, you know this pre-1947 voice evokes that for me. Anyway, so you had, I'm going to shift gears now. I don't have too much time left with you. So we had the music of the Baijis and then you had the music of the classicists, uh, the people who sang at the courts. Uh, I'll share a few of them with you. Uh, remember, this was a time of extreme turbulence and things went downhill for a lot of musicians, but uh, 1901 uh, is when Abdul Karim Khan Zab made his journey to uh, the southern part of India and gradually established what we know as it's called the Kirana Gharana today but actually the place you are talking of is the Kairana Gharana okay Kairana is a little town in Shamli district near Muzaffar Nagar and it's been in the news for all kinds of crap uh, uh, fairly recently uh, but that was the birthplace of the Kairana Gharana okay Bhimsen Joshi Kishoni Amankar uh, anyway so uh, I'm going to play you uh, some music by people who virtually established their Gharana in a certain way uh, the first person I'll sort of reintroduce you to is a gentleman by the name of Ustad Fayyaz Khan uh, he was from Agra, uh, made his reputation all across India and finally landed up in the court of the Maharaja of Baroda. Uh, he passed away there and his uh, grave was there too till 2002 when it was destroyed by a mob. Uh, but this is an example of how three minutes on a gramophone record could be really made to count. This man packs music into that three minutes to me very few people can. So let me share this Rag Darbari with you. You've never heard a Darbari like this. Uh, you know, Krishna Lord Shankar Pandit and people of his stature 
uh, rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed to the point where uh, you know they were veritable music machines. If Maharaj wanted to hear something all night, they sang all night because that was what they were paid to do. Uh, the recordings that we have of Krishna Rao Shankar Pandit, uh, you know, they're from the time when he was about 70 years old, 65, 70. He's losing his voice already. Uh, so he's just singing on the grammar or the mathematics of the music, the structure of the music, because he's already losing his voice. So uh, don't look for too much in terms of voice quality in these recordings. Just look at the kind of structure you're getting. Uh, there's within uh, classical music there are all kinds of music forms. So there's uh, something called a tappa, which is a very fast-paced kind of uh, uh, song, for lack of a better word. So I'll play you a modern recording of a tappa, sung by a, a singer called Malini Rajurkar who is also from the Gwalior Gharana so that you get an idea of what a tappa sounds like and then I will play you two short tappas by Krishna Rao Shankar Pandit just watch out for these they are all in Bhairavi so it will be easy for you to sort of stay in the same territory Like Bhim Sen Joshi, like other people, he adapted to whatever he heard and sort of 
found his own singing style. Uh, he lived a very penurious existence on the edge of the red light district almost in Bombay uh, for a very long time and uh, sort of broke through actually around the LP era which is where his style of very meditative singing could be captured effectively. Um, I'm going to leave you with an extract from a Ramdasi Malhar which he made in 1965 for All India Radio. Um, the, this piece is about, I mean, the piece I'll play for you is actually about 17 minutes long. If you can sit through it, fine, but I'll probably close in about 5, 7, 8 minutes, if that's okay with you. But uh, I'd urge you, this is no longer available on the net. It used to be, but it's available here with Anhar. Whoever wants it, please contact Shabnam team with a pen drive, she'll give it to you. Okay, if anyone's interested. So this is Ram Nasi Malhar, 1965, All India Radio, Ustad Ramil Khansa. Beyond 1950 up to maybe 1960, 
1870, you still have some degree of regional flavor. Marathi Sangeet sounds like Marathi Sangeet. Uh, beyond that, sub, sub jage, istri lagbe. And the ras, the regional ras of music got reached out somewhere. So find these people on the net. They are worth it. They give you music the way it was. So I really hope I can sort of urge you to go to websites and find these people. Because not even All India Radio plays them anymore. You have to find them for yourself. So thank you for bearing with me in this terrible audio. But very kind of you to sit with me through this. Come and sit with me again some other time for some longer time. Very kind. Thank you so much.